Hello, my name's Adam Martin, and welcome to another episode of Tacklebox Talk. I'd like to take this opportunity once again to thank our uh, Australian Recreational Fishing Foundation and all its member bodies, and also the FRDC for the opportunity to uh, present to you another episode of Tacklebox Talk. Tonight, we're going to talk about uh, citizen science, the big picture reasons why we are doing citizen science in wreck fishing, and why you should really be part of it too. So, Without uh, any further ado, we'll get to it. So, wreck fishing citizen science. Why should we do it? Well, as I mentioned before, there's plenty of people that uh, participate in that kind of citizen science. But they don't really know why they are doing it. Um, some people just go along for the ride because their friends are doing it. So we've come up with a bit of a vision. Uh, it goes something like this. Imagine an environment, a community, a culture that feels safe when it goes out fishing and then when you come back home at the end of the day, you're feeling satisfied and happy. So what do I mean by safe? Well, safe in the knowledge that you're doing the right thing as being part of something bigger than yourself safe in the knowledge that you won't be prosecuted for doing the wrong thing safe in the knowledge that there'll be fish there for tomorrow for yourself and the next generation and that you'll have continued access to those fish safe in the knowledge that you'll be able to rely on fishing for your health and safe in the knowledge of that fishing management is in good hands and a whole heap of other things so what can we do with wreck fishing citizen science what can we investigate? Well, we can investigate our well-being when out fishing. There's a whole heap of different programs, albeit very small ones, um, that uh, look after people's mental health, physical health, and uh, disability support. But if we scale up that citizen science in the well-being area, um, then we can use that data to then uh, create opportunities to um, deliver more services throughout Australia and creating more jobs and um, overall using wreck fishing as the tool for more better well-being. Um, then we can obviously look at habitat. There's so many different issues with habitat we can use citizen science to improve uh, habitat which means improved fishing and we have, have improved fishing we're happier. It's a win-win across the whole board. We can also use citizen science to um, investigate uh, fishing events and competitions and regional tourism. And by using that information, um, we can then uh, create opportunities to improve and uh, regional tourism many, many times over and therefore more jobs, uh, better experiences, and we're happier all around. Um, we can also uh, focus in right on one particular issue, like a, if there's a, a particular species that needs a bit of attention, we can use citizen science to delve into that and um, then use that information to make better management choices. And then we can also use citizen science to look into our motivations and behaviours. Um, and then we can create, again, more opportunities, tailor things, that uh, suit uh, the society at the time with the kind of motivations and, and uh, uh, the things that they do when out fishing to have better experiences. Plus, there's a whole heap of other things um, that we can do with wreck fishing citizen science. I'll give you an example. It's a real simple one. Um, about 10 years ago, there was a, a little um, wreck fishing citizen science program in Western Australia. Um, it was about improving demersal uh, species like snapper and dewfish, that kind of thing. And what it was is uh, there was about 93, uh, 93 participants that um, when they caught their fish, they brought it back to land, cleaned them, and then they had the fish frames. They donate those fish frames to scientists. The scientists would use them to collect information and eventually they use that information to make better decisions to look after our fish. And in the end, uh, they are now enjoying better fishing experiences. So from those 91 donors, 
that donated those fish frames. 93% of them said they wanted to do it because they felt like they were contributing to sustainability. And then of those same 91 donors, just over half said they were doing it to set a good example for their children. So we can see just from a really small citizen science program like that, that they have created better fishing experiences down the track and, and they have noted that. And then they're having better, happier days out fishing. So as mentioned earlier, um, we understand why we really should do wreck fishing citizen science. Remember that vision, that cause that I mentioned earlier about safe and the knowledge of all those things. And we can also then start to investigate what we really want to, um, to improve fishing. But for the Australian wreck fishing community to have a meaningful impact on, the, on a national scale, two critical things, two, keep popping up. And that is, one, the scale of participation in wreck fishing citizen science needed to influence positive cultural change. And two, trust. So let's take a look at the first issue that I just mentioned. A scale of participation at a national scale to influence positive cultural change. And I'll just get set up and I'll be back in a moment. So here's how we scale up. It's called the law of diffusion of innovation. So I'll draw something, you all will be familiar with it. It's a bell curve, a pretty rough one, but you'll get the idea. For any society, any culture, any community, it, it doesn't matter. Um, this kind of, uh, very closely, this kind of thing happens. Um, the science on this is pretty solid. So we have our high performers, our low performers, and then our average here. So our innovators, 2.5%. Th these are the, uh, the people like, uh, Steve Jobs and, and Elon Musk, you know, the big idea people. Um, and then we have the early adopters, this, this group here, and that's about roughly 12.5%. And then we have our uh, early majority and our late majority, and they're roughly 34% each. And then last but not least, we have our laggers, 16%. These people here, they're, um, they're the kind of people that have touch tone phones. And the reason they have touch tone phones is because they can't buy rotary phones anymore and they won't buy mobile phones. So be aware of them, that, that, that'll come up a little bit later. So the question we've got to ask is, how do we get the majority to um, take up citizen science and wreck fishing. We've got, it's a huge community that we have in Australia, millions of people. And the problem is that the, the, the majority, they're cynical, they're, they're practical. It's, uh, they ask, uh, what's in it for me? What do I do if, if something goes wrong? What, um, what happens to me? Uh, are you gonna pay me to do this? So, but the innovators and the uh, early adopters, not so much. They'll, um, they'll just do something because they think it's a great idea and be part of it. So the law states that at around 15 to 18% uh, is the tipping point. And once, once we get uh, uptake up to about 15 to 18%, something special happens. It's a, a social phenomenon where um, all of a sudden it kind of snowballs and the, the rest of the community starts taking up that new cultural change. And in this case, we're talking about um, participating in citizen science. So how do, we, how do we get to that point? Well, the law also states that m mostly, whenever we try to do something like this, the, um, that first 10% just get it. And a lot of the times, um, it doesn't go any further than 10%. And what we've got to do is cross what's called the chasm. It's this little part here. We need to get everyone to this tipping point. 
and then it'll start to snowball and people will take it up. The way we get to this tipping point is we ignore the majority. We don't talk to them, don't, don't even bother with them for the moment. We pick them up later. So we aim at the early adopters and the innovators um, because these guys here, the average, the, the, the bulk of everyone, they don't want to try something unless someone else has done it first. So that's why we target the uh, early adopters and the innovators. I'll give you an example, a great example. There's a, a man by the name of Simon Sinek. He's a, a world-renowned uh, public speaker about this kind of thing. So I'll uh, shoot through to him and uh, you can see him for a few minutes. He has a, a great example of how, how cultural change can happen and, and we can apply this to people taking up citizen science in wreck fishing. And let me tell you how it looks, because I've done it. So I, a large company, many, many more people than is in your company, 200,000 people, wanted me to help them do a millennial training program. So I said, great. I pull out my little pocket copy of the Law of Diffusion, because to me, this is religion. By the way, this is how I built my entire career. Remember that story I told you before, convince me why I should hire you? He told me he was over here. He didn't tell me he was over here. I could hear that. I ignored him for now. I'll get him later, right? Someone else will get him later. Um, so here's what we did. What the company wanted to do was traditional. They wanted me to design the program. We're going to launch it. We're going to make videos. They want me to be on the videos. And then we're going to have the training program, and we're going to force all the millennials to go through the training program. It'll be amazing. <laughs> and I'm thinking, it's going to fail. So this is what I said. I said, I'm going to do one workshop once. And we will make it open to anybody born after 1984 only. Which means if you were born before 1984, you're not eligible. That keeps all the senior executives out. <laughs> so they can't come and watch. Make sure. And the people who come in, we only have 100, 100 seats, 125 seats, and they have to apply. Because I want people to put in extra time and extra energy. And, and the problem with the internet is we've made everything easy. Let's try and make everything as so easy as possible. Click, 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 you're in. No, I want to make things a little bit difficult, right? So they had to fill out a proper essay and submit it. And we actually read all of them. And we could tell who was phoning it in. And we could tell who actually genuinely wanted to be there. And we selected 100, 100 people. And we only did it from the East Coast offices, just because it was convenient. So we did New York, it was on the East Coast, so New York and Virginia, right? Just because it was easier. Uh, maybe a few of the other offices, actually. There was also Chicago and all that. Whatever, a bunch of the offices. <laughs> I gave this wonderful workshop, and at the end of it, I said, hey guys, we don't have a millennial training program, we want to do one. So I'm asking for volunteers from this room to help build it. You're not going to get any extra money. You might have to uh, work extra hours on your own time, and you may or may not have this included in your compensation or promotion packages at all. Who wants in? I had 50 volunteers who said that they were going to help build this program for no additional money and no particular personal benefit. It's because they believed in it, right? Two weeks later, one of the senior executives from the company calls me up furious at me. He's so angry at me. Do you know why? Because leaders from across the entire country were calling up, screaming at him, why don't we get a millennial training program? Why is it only on the West Co East Coast? And I said, congratulations, that's called demand. <laughs> so that was really great to see uh, Simon Sinek, uh, the way he explained, he uh, got uh, that huge company to uh, take up um, that uh, millennials program. So and that's how we get a big following, a change of culture, and we start to see the better ex experiences associated with fishing. And that's how we'll do it uh, with citizen science and wreck fishing in the next 10 years. So now 
we'll talk about the the next big issue that we uh that we mentioned before and that was trust so what about trust so let's say that we've performed and collected all this mountain amount of information uh, from millions of hours from volunteers that's a lot of work and effort but if that information isn't used to benefit society and science and benefit the fish the environment and then so what's the point where's the meaningful impact there's been much research all over the world um, delving into fisheries management but more and more research of recent uh, has been looking into um, people it's swinging towards people rather than the fish habitat that is to say that f for fisheries to exist people must interact with them the fish will be just fine if the people don't interact with them like going fishing or the pollution that we create from um, being an industrialized society and this is where Australia often falls short of the mark compared to other nations. Some research that has come out, uh, which comes to mind, um, is by a guy named Ray Hilborn from the University of Washington in the northwest there of, of America. And he did this bit of project that was called Fisheries, Managing Fisheries is Managing People. What, have, what has been learned? So Ray states that there's a... to, to um, Understand the behavior of fishermen is a key ingredient to successful fisheries management. And in that research, he describes all these different um, things that can be done where community uh, works with governments and authorities to manage fish and have much better outcomes uh, in a co-managed, community-driven way. And one of those key ways was citizen science. So a great example of this can be found by some of our closest neighbours, the Pacific Island nations, like New Caledonia, Vanuatu, Solomon Islands, all, all those ones out there. So in about 2015, the Pacific Island nations, along with the Australian government, the uh, Australian Centre for International Agriculture Research and the University of Wollongong, uh, set off on a different path to ensure that they had a healthy ecosystem and a fishery for the future. So how did they do that? Well, they activated a holistic community driven approach to managing their fishery. And so they can continue to have good experiences and their community is much happier in this symbiotic relationship that they have with their authorities. It was called a new song for coastal fisheries, a pathway to change, the NAMIA strategy. So now that they are really beginning to see the positive outcomes um, from their and their community uh, is happier, my point is um, that the community is genuinely involved in a big way, like a symbiotic relationship with um, their community and the authorities. So coming back to Australia, how does wreck fishing citizen science fit into what I just spoke about? Well, today, mostly in Australia, much of what wreck fishing is about isn't rec not recognised by governments to the degree that we would like. And a lot of that comes down to a lack of trust. But what do I mean? When fishing representatives approach authorities to gain acceptance, recognition and trust so that we may advance wreck fishing interests, we simply do not have the data or the information needed when we're at the bargaining table to say, hey, we can do this. We can use citizen science to help us to get the information needed to take all the different parts associated with wreck fishing into a positive and scaled up direction. I'll give you some examples. Wellbeing, mental health, physical health, disability therapy. We can collect this information through citizen science and then uh, go to governments and authorities and say, hey, we want to create 250 non-profit uh, businesses that train up and, and employ people to deliver therapy using wreck fishing. Then we've got tourism, regional fishing locations and fishing events. Again, we can use citizen science to collect that information through those efforts. Go to government and authorities and say, hey, we want to create new opportunities in the regional tourism area and that creates new jobs too. Education, 
citizen science is perfect for building new skills and knowledge and especially in the school programs where we see teachers taking their students out in the field and um, they are learning hands-on it's a great way to learn sports competitions and tournaments that use uh, sporting style rules in their competitions we can collect that data through citizen science and then go back to the government and say, hey, we want to be recognized as a sport. Just like cricket or karate does with the, the data they collect to show that they are a sport, we can do the same. And then there's leadership and management. Uh, and what I mean by this is the data that we collect through citizen science that talks to about our behaviors and what drives us to go fishing can be used to train the next generation of managers so they understand how people operate because if you understand how the people interact with the fish then it's much easier to manage the fish and the habitat it's all about the people so gradually we start to see a shift of culture where the wreck fishing community begins to work with government in a more cohesive way we start to co-manage as a community and in, a, in some cases self-manage we start to prove to ourselves to the community. We prove ourselves to the authorities. Then eventually that tipping point comes, that 15 to 18% that I mentioned, where the bulk of the community, including the rec community, but the bulk of the community starts to come on board and, and takes on uh, this citizen science. Then the politicians start to take note and uh, they take a closer look. And don't worry, we'll make sure they see all the good work that's happening. Then that pressure starts to mount on the managers and they are forced to listen to the community because the community has already decided the positive direction they want to see wreck fishing go. But not all managers will be on board. Remember that 16%, the laggers, the rotary phone people? That's some of them. But that doesn't matter. They will come later. They will come. So within just a couple of years, we can use the first lot of collected data from a national citizen science program for wreck fishing and we start to build meaningful capacity within Australia's wreck fishing community. We'll begin to see positive social change. Relationships with authorities become on better terms. We begin to co-manage and self-manage that has real meaning. Our well-being is improved because of the government support that is pushed into the right areas rather than just guessing. We see habitat and fish stock improvements skyrocket. We see managers who are much more capable in interacting with the community rather than the confrontational, adversarial and sometimes dysfunctional relationships that we have at the moment. We see increased education right across the community, including schools. We see wreck fishing recognized as a sport nationally and in the last of the few states and the many benefits that come from that. We see a boom increase of regional tourism and the jobs that come with that. All of this work goes towards creating a new sustainable social and economic model for wreck fishing in Australia. Creating jobs for millennials and Gen Xs is something like of 100,000 new jobs by 2031 because wreck fishing citizen science had a large part to play in this paradigm shift. So why aren't we doing this? Well, you'll be happy to know that plans are underway to do just that. It is my hope that we will rapidly scale up so we can see the positive change creating that 100,000 new jobs. Because right now we are in a time, COVID-19 has allowed us to do this, where we can reinvent our wreck fishing looks in Australia. I'd like to thank you for your time, for listening. And now we'll head over to the Q&A. Thanks. Well, thanks for watching, folks. I put that together this afternoon um, because the presenter that we had lined up, able to make it after the father. Uh, we haven't received any questions, but what we will do, if you have questions over the next few days, just send a private message onto the uh, Australian Recreational Foundation Facebook page and we'll answer them. Um, next week, on next Thursday, on the 21st of January, we've got Matthew Barwick from the Fisheries Research and Development Corporation. We get to interview him.
and we'll be talking about uh, what might the future of fishing look like in Australia. And uh, I, I think we'll be dabbling in the culture area as well. It'll be really interesting. To see. So until then, we'll see you on Thursday, the 21st of January at 7 p.m. Australian Eastern Daylight Time, Daylight Savings Time. And until then, tight lines.